Joe hands him a box of Obama O's. And Paul Graham thought we just bought this stupid box of cereal. And he's like, no, this is how we fund the company. Mm -hmm. And Paul Graham said, if you can convince people to buy, pay $40 for a $4 box of cereal, maybe you can get strangers to stay in other strangers' homes. And he also liked us because he said we were cockroaches. And he said, it's an investment nuclear winter, and the only people that will survive are cockroaches, and you're a cockroach. <laughs> and so I'm like, thank you. It was actually the nicest thing. For like six months, that was the only compliment I got, was I was a cockroach. And I remember calling my mom, like, Mom, I'm a cockroach. I got in. <laughs> so that's how we got into Y Combinator, and that kind of was a turning point for us. Yep. And so, uh, but Y Combinator itself didn't make the numbers change. What was the thing that you did, or the couple of things that you did that changed the inflection? There were, there were two, th is this the one? Yeah. Sorry. There were two things. Um, the first thing was what Y Combinator did was it basically created a structure for us to work on it full time and live together. So in other words, we were all kind of working on it, but it was like everyone had other things going on in their life. And I think the enemy of a startup is everyone else's life. It's true, like you have life and you have vacations and you have conferences and you go away and you do other stuff. And it's like that is the enemy of a startup. Um, you know, Paul Graham used to say startups don't die, they just fade away. And so, um, you know, we basically decided for three months, Nate would move from Boston to San Francisco, and we'd wake up at 8 o'clock, we'd go to bed at midnight, seven days a week, and we'd work from 8 to midnight every single day. And seven days a week, you know, we'd get full night's sleep, but that was it. And we would, uh, in that dedication for three to four months, created this real serious rhythm where we weren't doing other things. We were totally focused. That was the first thing. The second thing was Paul Graham I, 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 think that's, I think the second thing was Paul Graham gave us a series of advice that probably changed our business forever. Um, probably the most important single piece of advice I got, which is probably advice that is probably the most important advice I can give you, or one of the most important advice, is he basically drew out this chart. And he basically said, it's better to have 100 people that love you, 100 customers that love you, than a million customers that just sort of like you. In other words, if you have 100 people that absolutely love your product, they'll tell 100 people, and then they'll tell 100 people, or even 10 people, and this thing will grow. We call it growing virally. In fact, almost all movements in history have grown this way as well. There's like deeply passionate followers, and they grow it, and they're customer advocates. And the problem is in Silicon Valley, the general wisdom is, I need to build some app, this thing, and needs to have this viral coefficient. I need to get millions of people to use it, and they gotta like it enough to share it. And that's totally the wrong way to think about it, especially if you're in a service business like ours. So Paul Graham said, all you have to do is get 100 people like you. Don't worry about millions of people. That was totally freeing. Because until then, I'm like, how the hell am I gonna get a million people to do this if I can't even get my mom or my sister to do it? But I can, get, I can find 100 people. And so we literally decided, do things that don't scale. If you, all you need to do is get 100 people to love you, do things that don't scale. It turns out 100 people that love you is really hard because it's easy 100 people to like you. 100 people to love you means you need to meet them. You need to understand their problem. And so we literally would fly during Y Combinator from Mountain View. We commuted from Mountain View to New York. We would go, Joe and I would go to New York and we'd go door to door because New York was where most of our community was. We would meet with every one of our hosts and we'd live with them. We literally would live with them. We'd write the first reviews for the places. And in fact, I would go there and I'd be like, wow, the photos are terrible. This is actually a really nice house. And the host is like, well, I can't figure out how to get photos onto my computer. This is before really the iPhone and high quality camera. They, this is just like people had to plug a camera into their laptop. And she thought, what if you just clicked a button and a photographer next day would magically show up and photograph your home? And they thought that'd be amazing. And so I went home with Joe and we borrowed a camera from one of our friends in Brooklyn like, who was a photographer and we knocked on the door and they're like, hello, yes, I'm here, the photographer. And they're like, wow, this is a small company. The founder's also photographing my home. <laughs> I used to also carry a bank ledger in my backpack. And if you need to get paid, I would just like rip out the check and I'd knock on your door and hand you a check. So um, that was also a reminder of how small we were. But the point was that doing things that don't scale, if you just think about go, b building something that even just one person loves, it's super easy to create something a single person loves, especially if it's a service. And then you go door, like person by person. Once you have 100 people, then you just focus on figuring out how to scale that. And it's a totally different intellectual problem to scale something 100 people love than figure out in, uh, what, what that is. And that was a turning point for us. And so by April 2009, we had hundreds of people that loved us. People started booking. And it became clear there was a real business here. And we, Paul Graham said, you have to be ramen profitable by demo day. Demo day is the end of Y Combinator when everyone presents to investors. Well, he said, 
beginning of 2009, it wasn't clear to be any investors. Sequoia Capital had put out this slide deck, RIP Good Times. That was like the worst possible thing for me to see at the time. I'm like, what do you mean good times? Like, these were, these, this last year has been the worst year of my life. What do you mean the good times are over? What's the next year going to be like? So, because it wasn't good the year before. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what this product. It's unbelievable the lack of dog fooding that happens. And so most people, when they think about growth, they think it's this convoluted thing where you're trying to generate these, you know, um, extra normal behaviors in people. And that's not what it's about. What it's about is a very simple, elegant understanding of product value and consumer behavior. And when you shroud yourself in all the bullshit veneer, and this is the single biggest problem in the valley today, you will miss the mark. And the problem is, is we're in this massive long tail where you've had these seminal huge successes occur, and now you have all these people who have two choices, and they're extremely difficult choices. Choice number one is you do what you think is right, independent of what the external feedback loop tells you. And choice number two is you do what you read about and what you get you know, credit for and what people tell you is interesting. And that second class of things destroys products. And it destroys people's ability to build something interesting. And it doesn't matter how good you are at your job, if that specific set of values isn't imbued in what you're building, you will fail. And it doesn't matter. And right now, that is the one most important thing that if you're going to leave away with this is just don't believe the hype and the bullshit that we're in right now. How do we do this? We didn't even come up with this framework. A guy worked for me. I'm not going to say who it is because I was literally like nine times I was going to fire this numbskull. And he once and he came to me and said, Chamath, at eBay we had this framework. eBay, this is 2007. I'm like, eBay? eBay sucks. <laughs> What can I learn from eBay? And he said, well, we had this framework we used at eBay. And we tweaked it a little bit. And what I realized was, oh my gosh, you know, there's this massive amount of complexity when expressed in simplicity can be extremely useful. And the tweaks that we made, eBay is a different product. And eBay now is a wonderful company doing really, really well. Um, who laughed? Come on, it's doing really well. Uh, uh, <laughs> was we sort of created a framework in which we applied those three very simple principles of measuring, testing, and trying things. And we said, OK, the biggest risk that we have is we alienate the people that trust us today and use the product. And when you alienate someone, what happens is it's actually not palatable generally in uh, top level metrics. But there's just this extremely long tail. So like anecdotally, you can look at companies and you know, you know, let's like not to pick on HP as an example, but you look at HP. Um, you're, you're signaling me? 10 minutes? I have 10 minutes left? Jesus Christ, okay. Um, and you ask yourself, you know, and I know Meg Whippen, she's actually a really great CEO. So what happened? Well, there's no product innovation right now, and they have to figure out where their growth comes from. Well, when you trace that thing back, well, it's a decision that was made maybe five or six years ago when it was all about cutting costs and optimizing for short-term revenue. And so you realize, okay, well, that's the long tail. That's how long it takes these things to manifest. Similarly, my biggest fear was we spam our users and we trick them, and it will alienate these people. You won't see it today, but you'll see it in three years from now or four years from now. And it accelerates when you compound that with a competitor who actually builds a better product that doesn't alienate people. So the most important thing that we did against our framework was I teased out virality and said, you cannot do it. Don't talk about it. Don't touch it. I don't want you to give me any product plans that re revolve around this idea of virality. I don't want to hear it. What I want to hear about is the three most difficult and hard problems that any consumer product has to deal with. How do you get people in the front door? How do you get them to an aha moment as quickly as possible? And then how do you deliver core product value as often as possible? And after all of that is said and done, only then can you propose to me how you are going to get people to get more people. And that single decision about not even allowing the conversation to revolve around this last thing, in my opinion, was the most important thing that we did. And when I look again in the landscape, things that scale understand that principle, whether it's explicitly or intuitively. 
and things that don't, and also things that have this amazingly steep rise and then fall off a cliff, and there are really visible examples of that today, also ignore that principle. And it's the discipline to not optimize for the thing that gives you the shortest and most immediate ROI. Because that is never the sustainable thing that allows you to build something useful. So when you boil that all up, the most important two high-level takeaways that we had, and after all of this stuff was, we got to eliminate ego. And ego manifests itself every day. So I talked about it earlier. It's the ego of basically living a lifestyle and a vision and like a Twitter stream than it is actually like living the life of an entrepreneur building good product and trying to deliver core product value. That takes ego, meaning you have to be comfortable not being rewarded in the short term. And then the second is to invalidate all the lore. In any given product, there's always people who strut around the office like, you know, I have this gut feeling. It's all about gut feeling. And most people gut feeling are fucking morons. They don't know what they're talking about. They just don't. If we lived on gut feeling, you can look at what happens when you live on gut feeling. Look at the financial markets. Look at how government works. Look at how all of these industries that are completely broken. Gut feel is not useful because most people can't predict correctly. We know this. So one of the most important things that we did was just invalidate all of the lore. As much as we didn't do stuff, all we did was disprove all of the random anecdotal nonsense that filtered around the company. Well, I think it's this, that you know, people are using it because of that, and I want to do this. And, and it's like, where, where did you pull that out of? And you know where they pulled it out of. And they just, again, wanted to do it to go back and you know, reinforce a sense of ego. And a lot of people don't have a culture within a company that allows these two things to happen. And if you can't be extremely clinical and extremely unemotionally detached from the thing that you're building, you will make these massive mistakes and things won't grow because you don't understand what's happening. It takes a really special type of person to not believe the bullshit, and an even more special person to not conflate luck and skill. You have to be, if you're in this type of job, in my opinion, relatively cynical, and you can be confident. Fuck, you can be arrogant. It doesn't really matter. But you can't believe your own BS. Because when you do you start to compound these massively structural mistakes that, again, don't expose core product value and then don't allow real engagement and real product value to emerge. You don't listen to consumers because you think it's all about your gut. You don't bother doing any of the traditional, straightforward, obvious things that would allow you to answer very straightforward, obvious questions. And you lose yourself. Most people, unfortunately, are, just don't know what they're talking about. I'm, I hate this letter. This letter is the dumbest letter in the, in the alphabet. You people are doing more when you focus on this to ruin the internet for the entire human race. Don't talk about this anymore. Just stop. Talk about being in the weeds and not understanding what you're doing. There's no context when you talk about this. None whatsoever. You are spammers. And spamming is pathetic, and it ruins the experience. Don't do it. We never talked about this once. It never came up once. I didn't have some little guy, you know, tickling the ivories on his little Excel spreadsheet, telling me what K values were. And all. Tell me how I'm acquiring people. Tell me how we're doing getting them to their aha moment. And tell me core engagement. Don't give me these low-level abstractions that allow you to validate, short, get short-term results in ROI that don't mean anything. Don't focus on things that destroy long-term value. Don't give me stuff that allows you to trick yourself into thinking you know what you're talking about. I'd rather you say you don't know, and I'd rather us figure stuff out together. What I don't want to have happen is a culture where you take these short-term things, you start working on it in the absence of context, and you have these meteoric rises, 
and what you have is massive churn and fall off, and everyone's looking around with their hands in their pockets thinking, well, what just happened? I thought I was doing a really great job. Well, you're not doing a really great job. You optimize the variable. Now, there may be somebody on your team that should be doing that, but it should be doing that in the context of something much more important. So you destroy a lot of value when you abstract away that high-level goal to something so ridiculously stupid. I'm like, I'm like raining on everybody's parade today. <laughs> Core product value is really elusive and most products don't have any. I actually fundamentally believe that. But I also believe this monkey has been trained that when the little light comes on, it's one of those sessions where I can now get food, and it knows that if I press this lever 10 times, after a little bit of a delay, I'll get some food. If I press the lever 10 more times, I'll get some more food. It understands the task. So what do we have here? We have first a signal, the light coming on, saying it's one of those sessions. We're starting one of those. Then the monkey does the work, and then with a delay, it gets the reward. And what everyone initially thought was dopamine would go up after the reward. That's not when it goes up. It goes up when the signal comes on. What's this? This is the monkey there sitting and saying, I know this. I know the drill. I know this. I'm on top of this. This is going to be great. I know what I do now. This is completely perfect. 100% I'm going for today. Dopamine is not about pleasure. It's about the anticipation of pleasure. It's about the pursuit of happiness rather than happiness itself. And what's most remarkable is experimentally, if you block that rise of dopamine from occurring, you don't get the work. You don't get the behavior. This is not only the anticipation, but this is what is capable of eliciting goal-directed behavior. Amazing elaboration on this, which now begins to tell us something real familiar. Okay, so in this study, elaboration, rather than this design, you press the lever the right number of times, you get reward. Do the work, you get a reward 100% of the time, that's how it works. Now instead shift to where you get the reward only 50% of the time. You do the work and only about half the time you get the reward. So what happens to dopamine levels there, this is what they do they go through the roof. Because what have you just done? You've introduced the word maybe into the equation. And maybe is addictive like nothing else out there. Because the light comes on and you're doing the, I know how this works, this is gonna be great, but I screwed up last time because I didn't get the food, but this time I'm feeling good today, but I'm a total screw up, and I'm inadequate in junior high school, and it was terrible, and I can't, but maybe this time this is my lucky day, and just vacillating all over the place. What we see here is dopamine comes pouring out like mad. It's the uncertainty of the reward. And here's the really elegant thing they did in that study. Now, instead of a 50% reward rate, either a 25% or a 75%. These are diametrically opposite states. Worse news, better news, the only thing they have in common is you decrease the level of unpredictability and the rise in dopamine winds up being halfway between the 50% and the 100. And what's this about? This is the world of brilliant social engineering by humans, say, in Las Vegas, who understand how to design a place to take a curve where somebody has a gazillionth of 1% chance of getting a reward and making you think because it's this special day in this casino and you especially are so much tilted to the right that you are going to get, and humans are profoundly manipulable in this realm. And it turns out, so are other species, the exact same neurochemistry. So what winds up being unique about us? And what you see is, with humans, it's the time dimension. You get the signal, you do the work, you get the reward. And the question becomes, how much time, lag time, can there be between the work and the reward to still elicit the behavior, to still get the work coming out? And we have just entered uniquely human terrain there for the very simple reason that probably most of us recognize, which is somewhere along the way, almost all of us worked very hard in school to get good SAT scores, to get into a good college, to get GREs, to get into a good grad school, to get a good job, to get in the nursing home of our own choice there, sort of thing. 
And what we see is this astonishing ability of humans to keep those dopamine levels up for decades and decades waiting for the reward. And in the most bizarre, unique realm of this in humans, sometimes we could maintain it with a belief system where the reward doesn't come in our lifetime. The reward comes after our death. The reward comes in our afterlife. The reward comes unto the next generations. And there's no monkey out there who's willing to lever press all the time because of what St. Peter's going to think somewhere down the line. So that is unique about us. On this earth. So most people, first of all, tend to think about, you know, good things, right? Which is a positive thing. Actually, I can tell you, we'll come later in the course, it's good to think that lots of positive things are happening. It's kind of a nice place to be in terms of being a happy person. Right? Um, but it turns out uh, that uh, uh, people have done studies like this. So now this is particularly sensitive for a faculty member, but it could work for any sports team you've tried out or anything you've tried out for in your life. So what happens when we get reviewed for tenure? And you hear a bit about that. This, is, this was an easy study for, for psychologists to do. What they did is, they called up people in the fall who were being reviewed for tenure. Um, and you know, you get tenure or you don't. And it's a bit of a sad process if you don't, right? Because you don't get tenure and then you don't feel happy about that and you have to call your parents and say, I didn't get tenure. And your parents go, come on, if you just slept better, you would have gotten tenure. And, you know, <laughs> remember the piano lessons you didn't take and you go, all right. So, so, so you know, it's a bit of a nuisance, right? And on top of that, because weirdly in academics, we tend to be super specialized, you have to move out of town, okay? Uh, you don't have to, but typically then a person who doesn't get tenure will get a job somewhere else. There's plenty of stories of people who don't get tenure at awesome places who are, who are geniuses in history, okay? The tenure decisions are often wrong. But still, you'd rather get it than not. You'd rather you know, get into a medical school than not. You'd rather make a sports team you want to be on than not. Um, so here's what they found out. If they asked them, uh, what happens if you don't get tenure? Everybody said, oh, it's going to be awful. It's going to be miserable. I'm going to be such an unhappy person. Two years later, the average happiness of people who didn't get tenure was equal to the average happiness of people who did get tenure, okay? So, okay, you could say, well, tenure, only professors care about tenure. Uh, how about winning the lottery, okay? You know, what if I won hundreds of thousands of dollars? There's been a lot of psychology on this, actually. Uh, in about a year to two, the average happiness of a lottery winner who wins a substantial amount of money is rated the same by him or her as it was uh, the population as a whole. Yeah? Yeah, so this is, we'll come back to this, but I'll tell you. So, so this is, this is you, you can like this or not like this, okay? So in some parts of psychology, we measure things like reaction time to the millisecond. That's, you know, good data, right? Or brain activation, that's good data. When you ask a person how happy they are, the only thing we can do is have you basically fill a scale from one to seven. How happy are you, okay? And you could go, well, I'm a little worried about that because, you know, you know sometimes people are like, I hope that makes you happy or something, that, you know, right? So you could say, how, how much can we trust subjective reports of happiness? And that's a very good question. On the other hand, it's hard to know what would be better than that, right? It's, it, we, we don't, it's like if we measure your pulse, is that a m better measure of your happiness? No, you, you know, you, you, your pulse could be racing because you're sad or happy, scared or enthusiastic. So we don't have a better one that we can think of. But psychologists do worry that sometimes people will just say what they're supposed to say or they'll pretend they're happy or things like that. We have to worry about those things, right? So you could worry deep down, but, but a year or two later, people who win huge amounts of money don't report themselves as any happier than people around them. Um, and kind of amazingly, but I think it's deep about life, uh, accidents leading to quadriplegia or paraplegia, accidents that, you know, b before you had such an accident, you would imagine that it would be a, uh, something um, uh, extremely difficult, and it can be in many ways, but by self-report, uh, ratings of happiness return to typical average populations of the same age in about three months. So what's a huge lesson here uh, in happiness research, a huge surprise is two things. We're kind of bad at predicting what will make us happy or sad, which is kind of weird, right? I mean, we're kind of bad at predicting it. Here's all these things where we think you know, they would make us happy or make us not so happy. It turns out we're wrong uh, once it's studied at all scientifically. 